Hello and good morning. I'm Joe Dammel, the Managing Director of Buildings on Fresh Energy's Energy Transition Team. I'm so excited to welcome you to our seventh annual Benefit Breakfast. And I'm Mari Ojeda, Senior Policy Associate on Fresh Energy's Energy Access and Equity Team. Joe and I will be your co-host this morning. And I speak for Joe, myself, and the whole Fresh Energy team when I say thank you for being with us today. This is our third year holding our Benefit Breakfast virtually. And while we're looking forward to gathering together in person in the future, we're excited to see folks with us this morning from across Minnesota and beyond. Now please take a moment to share where you're joining us from in the chat box. This morning, you'll be hearing about some game-changing progress that Fresh Energy made this year. And we truly cannot do it without your support. Thank you. As we dive into our program, don't forget to refer back to your program and event packet that was mailed or emailed to you with more information about what to expect this morning. It's also linked on the Benefit Breakfast page on our website. And I know it's early, but please be sure to stay with us until the end this morning. I've heard some exciting news will be shared before we sign off. As you can imagine, our 30-year anniversary played a huge role in helping us set the theme for our Benefit Breakfast, our shared challenge, Together We Can Do Hard Things. As Fresh Energy celebrates three powerful decades of driving high-impact and innovative clean energy policies across Minnesota and the Midwest, we know firsthand that this is a challenge we all share. Fresh Energy's determination to build a carbon-neutral economy that is just, prosperous, and resilient, a clean energy future that benefits everyone, is more critical than ever. Together, we are shaping the course of history, using public policy to tackle climate change and ensure that we will have a clean, healthy planet for future generations. Before we dive into our program, I want to acknowledge that this event would not be possible without the support from business partners and individuals who generously sponsored today's program and donated to the Match Pool. Thank you to our title sponsor, Parable Wealth Partners, our innovation and technology sponsors, Mortensen, New Energy Equity, and RAR Corporation, our visionary partner sponsors, Atomic Data, Ecolab, Evergreen Energy, Great River Energy, Parkera, and Excel Energy, and to all of our clean energy champions and friends of the future sponsors. And thanks to our generous match pool sponsors, all gifts this morning of $250 or more will be doubled. I'd also like to recognize the many table captains who worked so hard to bring all of us together this morning. You are instrumental in making this event a success. And thank you to our board member and event chair, Eric Posse, for all the time, effort, and leadership you put into making this event awesome. And finally, I also want to acknowledge all of the organizational allies and partners who worked alongside us at Fresh Energy, our incredible board of directors, and of course, my phenomenal colleagues, the team at Fresh Energy. Here, here. Thank you, Mari. As our theme says, together we can do hard things. A huge part of doing hard things is continuing to grow public understanding and support for a carbon neutral economy. And the first stop for that is explaining to people what Fresh Energy does and how we're part of the solution. So we put together a short explainer video to help set the stage for how Fresh Energy makes change in Minnesota and beyond. Take a look. When it comes to climate, the next few years will seal our fate. While our individual actions are important, there's still so much that needs to be done on a larger scale and quickly. That's where coming together with others to impact policy comes in. Our laws determine so much from how we get our energy, whether we allow pollution in our air and water, and what our governments should invest in. And the seeds of incremental change in policy transform into incredible impact over time. For the last three decades, concerned Minnesotans have been coming together with fresh energy to advance energy and climate solutions at the state and local levels. From pushing coal plants to wind down and close, to driving utility investments in renewable electricity, to cutting carbon emissions to zero. We've been shaping and driving bold policy since the 90s. There's still so much more work to do, and this work is more urgent than ever before. Together, we can do this, but we need all hands on deck now. Join others who share a commitment to our future generations and let's lead the way in securing an equitable, clean energy future where all can thrive. Fresh energy, bold policy for a just carbon-free future. Join us today. 
This video is such a fun, approachable snapshot of how fresh energy works and gets at the heart of why we're gathered here this morning, the knowledge that together we can do hard things. Recent federal investments on climate confirmed what we already knew to be true. The energy transition is underway and gaining momentum. And fresh energy is working every day to plan, advocate for, and drive equitable policy to keep moving us forward to our shared clean energy future. But how do we get to that future here in Minnesota? For fresh energy, it means bringing more renewables online faster and urging our utilities and leaders to plan for the grid of the future. It means stopping investments in new fossil gas infrastructure and scrutinizing our current gas system. It means making our buildings more efficient, rethinking transportation, and advancing equity throughout all of our work. It also means giving Minnesotans the tools for taking action to get the carbon out of their lives and get involved in energy advocacy. And finally, more important than ever, it means making sure Minnesota most effectively and fully utilizes federal funds coming to our state from both the bipartisan infrastructure law signed last year and the historic and game-changing Inflation Reduction Act that became law in August. All right. Yeah. <laughs> now I want to tee up our first guest of the morning, Ryan Padchadsaram, who is no stranger to planning for our clean energy future. At Kleiner Perkins, Ryan serves as advisor to the chair and is co-author with John Doerr of the national bestseller, Speed and Scale, the book that's making waves by, in a nutshell, providing a plan for solving the climate crisis. Take it away, Ryan. Hi, everybody. My name is Ryan Pinchotsram. I'm the co-author of a book called Speed and Scale, as well as the technical advisor to the chairman of Kleiner Perkins. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today, and we're going to unpack the climate crisis and understand uh, what plan can get us from the 59 billion tons of emissions down to zero. And so for the first question is, why do we have a climate crisis? And that's because we have an emissions crisis. To do all of the things we enjoy and to live the way we do, we burn fossil fuels to drive, to fly, to cook on a gas stove, to heat and cool our buildings to build the infrastructure we drive on, as well as the buildings that we're in through concrete and steel, we burn fossil fuels. And there's no way around that without technologies. And the reason we go after fossil fuels is because these dense forms of energy have been in the earth compacted and have formed, whether it be coal, which comes from fossilized plants, or oil and gas, which comes from plankton, we are able to extract them and burn them uh, for use. And so to get a little wonky and nerdy, I can share this chart here. This is what we call a flow diagram. And so us here assembled in this room, when we think about tackling the climate crisis, well, the emissions crisis, these are the drivers. These are the sources of those emissions. You can see in blue natural gas. Well, that provides power to buildings as well as heat for residential, commercial, and industrial applications. You can see that coal, primarily used for electricity generation. You can see petroleum used mainly for moving cars and planes. And so you can see these drivers and we've got to find alternatives for the things on the left. And the fact is the reason why we're hurrying is because we've emitted far too many greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases like CO2, carbon dioxide are one of them, but there are also worse ones like methane and nitrous oxide and other industrial gases. But this release into the atmosphere is what has been causing this warming. And when we look at the number that we're going after, this is where it's from, right? We emit 24 gigatons of year, a year in our energy sector, 12 in industry, nine to produce the food we eat, eight to move us around in transportation, and then six from nature. So this is what it adds up to. When you open up the reports and ask the question, well, how many more gigatons can we emit, right? How do we keep warming to these targets that people talk about, like one and a half degrees or two? Well, the UN put together a report that says to keep warming to one and a half degrees, we can only emit 400 more gigatons. That's our carbon budget. And unfortunately, we're going to go through that budget in less than this decade. And if you look to the other thresholds of limiting it to 1.7 or 2, we're really going to go through those in the next two. And so the path where that we're headed on, the reason why we all do the work we do, is to not let this happen. And so the big question of what is the plan? 
how do you go from 59 to zero is one that both John Doerr and I try to tackle. Speed and scale is not just John and I, it's actually a group of a hundred different activists, scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and founders sharing their stories tackling the climate crisis. But also inside it, it's packed numbers. This We use this tool called objectives and key results to put out the plan and the key results that show that we are, were able to get there. And so the plan is quite simply this. Objective number one, we've got to electrify transportation. So the work that we do to get people out of fossil fuel vehicles is so critical. We've got to decarbonize the grid. When you look at the work that fresh energy has done around ending coal plants, this is how you move the gigatons here. We've got to fix food, quite simply, eating less beef, eating less lamb, not asking folks to go vegan. We just need to stop eating the high emitting proteins so frequently. We've also got to waste less in compost as well, too. We've got to protect nature. This is quite simply ending deforestation. Those six gigatons a year come from us burning and changing how we use our forests. We then have to clean up industry. This is concrete, steel, as well as plastics and other materials. And no matter how aggressive we are, by the way, on one, two, three, four, and five, when you look at our model, you look at the UN's model, you're still left with about five or 10 gigatons. And so we've got to invest in ways to remove carbon using nature as well as engineered methods. So this is how we go and get to zero. The thing is we got to get there quicker, right? We have that carbon budget. And so the second half of the book talks about the accelerants, the things that you and I can pull on. We can win the politics and policy, right? Take these commitments that countries are making and pass laws that help make them happen. We can turn movements into action. This is everywhere from the ballot box to the boardroom, right? Getting companies to make the commitments that matter, getting voters to be activated around this issue. We've got to innovate. This is about driving down the cost of clean technology. And then we've got to invest because this transition is going to need more capital in research and development and philanthropy and project finance, as well as the world that I am in is, is venture capital. So those were the solutions. These are the accelerants. And when you unpack the plan, which I'll let you do later, each of these is paired with a set of really measurable and time-bound key results. And you actually can go online to see this. If you go to speedandscale.com, you can drill into each one of these objectives, see a key result, and see how we're doing on it. Like these key results here, which are the ones that we all need to be focused on. These are the ones that are code red. These are the ones where year over year, we're not making the difference that we need to, and they're in the multi-gigaton territory. But you can also click into places to get some hope, seeing places where we are making great progress, like the production as well as cost reduction of batteries. This here is moving faster than anyone expected and can get to the targets that we set out in speed and scale. And then there are other areas, because we're updating this quarterly, well, that have gone off course recently, right? The many of years of work over the past, I would say, decade getting the price of an electric vehicle down was picking up pace, but because of the supply chain crunch the world is feeling right now, the prices have ticked up. But we're going to track this measure because when a electric vehicle becomes more affordable than the fossil fuel equivalent, market forces begin to take over, right? Because when you're picking and choosing the clean green thing, well, it's the cheaper thing, and that matters. And you can see on speed and scale a bunch of data as well, too, on, on any of these KRs, things we track, like what are the business commitments? As you can see here, it's not where it needs to be. There's also this great action guide that we put out, right? We have the book, we have this action, sorry, this tracker that has what uh, and where the gigatons are. Well, this here answers, well, what can I do? And so we put out there, what are the two to three biggest actions that you can take in 2022? to remove gigatons from your environment, right? And so I really encourage people to go to speedandscale.com and check these ones out. And really, I'm here to also thank you because it's really the work that happens in this room that's so important, right? We're all here celebrating, one, the recent achievement that happened in DC with IRA, but the follow through happens here at the state and local level, right? Those things that IRA put in place help set the foundation for a lot of the work that needs to happen in the state level, local level, things that need to happen in our public utility commissions, things that need to happen in our schools, at our cities, the way we treat roads. And so the work is up to us. And I'm so excited to be on this journey with you. And so thank you for having me today. Have a wonderful one. 
Wow, what an energizing way to start the morning. I really appreciate how readable and practical this book is. And at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. Speed and scale. And that's what drives Fresh Energy's work to make progress at the speed and scale of the climate crisis. For three decades, Fresh Energy has worked to advance innovative, equitable, and impactful energy and climate policy here in Minnesota and the Midwest. That dedication speaks to the deep commitment and passion we have for solving the climate crisis, including Fresh Energy's team, alumni, board members, and all of you at home. And it's that passion for the issues of climate and energy that draws so many people to Fresh Energy. Now we're gonna hear from people who embody that passion, Power Circle donor, Melissa Rappaport Schiffman and her daughter, Ellie Schiffman. They filmed a special short video to tell us about their climate and energy story and why this work is so important right now. Hello and good morning. My name is Melissa Rappaport Schiffman. I go by Lissy and I've been a Fresh Energy supporter for over 20 years. And I have my daughter, Ellie, joining me today so we can both share with you why this work is so important. Yeah, I mean, this is our future. That's right. I believe that climate change is the biggest issue facing humanity, and we're pretty pressed for time to mitigate the problem. We need all hands on deck right now. I agree, Mom. Who knows what the future will look like for us? I've already experienced firsthand the effects of more extreme weather. Like last summer in Colorado, we couldn't go hiking because of the air quality from the forest fires. Yes, it really has an impact on us all, and it's not just the forest fires. We know that burning fossil fuels contributes to smog and unhealthy air quality, and this issue is often worse depending on your income or where you live. I know I'm worried about the increasing challenges we'll experience in my lifetime, and even more concerned about our kids and their future. It affects everything and everyone's livelihood. You know, it's not something that my friends and I talk about a lot because it's just too stressful and it's so overwhelming. I'm just trying to manage what tests I need to study for and all my activities outside of school. How am I supposed to help create the meaningful change we need? Yes, it can be overwhelming. I like to think of it at different levels. And we start with the things we can control as individuals, like electrifying our homes and cars. Then there's the institutional level, like schools, businesses, and organizations. And as individuals, we can influence those organizations we're involved in and try to get them to go carbon neutral. Yeah, but will, that, will all that stuff really make a difference? It seems like we need more meaningful change at a higher level. Yeah, that is true. And that higher level is public policy, which has the most significant impact. And that's exactly why we support Fresh Energy, because it's laser focused on our biggest areas of need, transportation, buildings, energy generation, and a clean energy economy. Since it's hard to do this work as individuals and even as a business owner, it's been important for our family to support nonprofits like Fresh Energy, who are working toward an equitable, carbon neutral future at the policy level. It sounds like Fresh Energy is doing pretty important work and that we should all be doing everything we can to drive this change, like now. With that, we'd like you to invite you all to be part of this mission. It is clear that our moment for game-changing progress is now, and I think that I can speak for my peers and ask you to join us in supporting this cause, because this is our future. And to my peers, let's show that we care about our future and our children's future. Fresh Energy is asking for a donation of $125, and every dollar makes a difference. But if you have the capacity, please consider a larger gift. You can join our family in becoming a Power Circle donor by making a gift of $1,000 or more. This will help accelerate our shared goal of a healthier and more equitable future. And don't forget that a generous pool of donors has agreed to match any donation of $250 or more. On behalf of our whole family, thank you so much for supporting Fresh Energy with your generous gifts. Thank you, Lissy, and good morning, everyone. I'm Ted Kontag, and I'm a founding partner at Parable Wealth Partners, and I also serve on Fresh Energy's board of directors. I'm joined this morning by my great friend, Pam Moret. I first got to know Pam when she was an executive at a Fortune 300 firm here in Minneapolis. And since leaving there, much of her time has been focused on giving back and making a difference in the world. Thank you, Pam, for joining us this morning. It's great to be here, Ted. Pam and I are both really passionate about the health of our climate and the importance of using our resources to make a positive impact in the world. Like the great video at the start of the breakfast demonstrated, together we can do 
big things. Pam, would you be willing to share a little bit about yourself and your giving story? Thanks, Ted. Well, I'm a retired financial services executive and now work part-time as a corporate director and consultant. Philanthropy is really important to me, and I see the global climate crisis as one of the biggest issues of our time. And I gotta tell you, I'm so inspired by Fresh Energy's work. I know, me too. I think we've known each other for 20 years and I've always been struck by how generous you are with your time and your money. What drives that, Pam? That's very kind of you to say, Ted. My husband Mark and I are very committed to being philanthropic. We support a variety of environmental and climate causes, our church, and several important human rights organizations. Because last time I checked, we can't take it with us. <laughs> so I believe we should do our best to make an impact in the here and now. My dad used to say to me and my siblings, to whom much is given, much is expected. I've been very fortunate in my life. So when I can share and give it back in a meaningful way, also to a great organization, that's the best of the best. And what about you, Ted? I know that giving back is really important to you and your family, and that it's also a core value of the work at your firm. Thanks, Pam. My wife and I are driven to do what we can to make the world a better place. We support homeless youth and early childhood education, but if we don't also work to solve the climate crisis at the same time, all these other issues are just gonna keep getting worse. That's why we personally support Fresh Energy. We love their optimism and their expertise on energy and policies through the roof, and they are truly having a positive environmental impact in Minnesota and beyond. When I attended my first Fresh Energy Benefit Breakfast six years ago, the presenter outlined the three things that have to happen to solve our climate issues. We need great public policy, and we need new and innovative technologies, and we need the money in the economy to support the companies that are trying to be part of the solution rather than support the companies that are part of the problem. At our financial planning firm, Parable Wealth Partners, we've built investment portfolios to try to do just that for our clients, portfolios that focus on critical environmental, social, and governance values. That's why Parable Wealth is sponsoring today's event. Ted, that's fabulous. It's great to see that Parable Wealth Partners is part of the solution with their thoughtful investment strategies. And you're absolutely right. I'm convinced that generosity makes a difference. And it can come in big and small ways. It all matters. Just like the small but important actions we each take in our home to make a difference in preserving the environment, Making financial contributions of any size can also have a tremendous impact, especially when it's multiplied with many people participating. People may think their donation is such a small amount it won't matter, but that is not true. It does matter, especially when people join together like we are this morning. It's inspiring to see so many people coming together to make the world a better place. I love it. Well said, Pam. And with today's generous match, these gifts have an even bigger impact. I've seen firsthand the enormous amount of good Fresh Energy is doing with these financial gifts. So on behalf of the Fresh Energy Board of Directors, I want to thank each of you for being here and for your generous support. Yes, the generosity is so appreciated. Now let's get back to the show. All right, let's go. Thank you so much, Ted and Pam for sharing your personal giving journeys this morning. And thank you also to Melissa and Ellie for such a heartwarming mother and daughter story. And of course, we're so grateful to all of you who just took the time to make a donation. We're talking today about how together we can do hard things. And we're honored to be joined by someone whose work illustrates that sentiment. I'm incredibly pleased to introduce our featured speaker, Julian Brave Noisecat. Julian is a nationally acclaimed journalist and thought leader has become a force for climate action across movements. First, we'll hear his keynote, which will be followed by an interview with Michael Noble. Welcome, Julian. Wait, ko hoyt up, Julian Brave Noise Cat wins flexed. Hoyt a kooks jetchum to ho hoyt up na elia pin Hello, everyone. My name is Julian Brave Noise Cat. Uh, I've built a career at the intersection of climate politics, policy advocacy, and indigenous rights. And I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being here today and for caring about and supporting such an important issue and organization. You know, I was actually born in Minneapolis. And for the first two years of my life, I lived in a little house in St. Paul. 
while I haven't lived in Minnesota since then, my little sister actually goes to school here in Carleton. So it feels good to, to touch those roots in Minnesota and to be with you all today, at least virtually. Um, I just want to start with um, the presence of the climate crisis in my own life, if that's okay. Uh, just last week, in fact, I was I was reminded of how devastating and close to home the climate crisis is. Uh, I was up in British Columbia, Canada, where my family comes from, for my cousin Stephen Daniels Jr.'s one-year memorial. Stephen has a daughter named Jaylene, who's like a little sister to me. And Jaylene's mother's side of the family comes from this place called Lytton, Lytton, British Columbia. It's the town that actually was burned to the ground by a wildfire one day after thermometers broke all-time Canadian temperature records. And just months after that, wildfire Lytton actually faced massive flooding and landslides that took out entire mountain faces and big chunks of highway. So in less than a year, Jaylene, my cousin, who's like a little sister to me, lost her father, and then she very nearly lost her family's own home and homeland. I'm incredibly grateful that her papa, her grandfather's house on the Siska Indian Reserve, um, which is just outside of Lytton, was one of the few spared by the earth, by the wind, by the fire, and by the water in the last year. And, um, you know, they're, they're in really generous people, Jaylene's family, the Michelles. Uh, like many Native families in our region, including my own, um, the Michelles actually fish and dry salmon right around this time of year. So last weekend when I saw Jaylene and her, and her grandfather, Maurice, um, they gave me a big bag of wind-dried Fraser River sockeye. And, you know, I, I actually fished the last of that fish just, um, just last night. And as I did, I, you know, I, I thought about um, the people and that land in Lytton. And I thought about Jaylene and about Maurice and about the Michelles. And I worried about what an even warmer future has in store for them. So I'm very grateful um, to have that fish. And I'm also very grateful to be invited to speak with you all today. You know, the fight for climate action, for climate adaptation, and for climate justice is, in my view, one of the most epic fights in human history. And I am very, very proud of the small, small contributions I've made to it. So today, I just want to tell you a little bit about the role I played in getting um, one real change maker and champion for climate action, adaptation, justice into office. And that's Interior Secretary Deb Holland. Deb Holland, as some of you might know, is actually the first Native American cabinet secretary in United States history. I'll just say that one more time. She's the first Native American cabinet secretary in United States history. Until 2020, there had not been a single Native American in the American cabinet. And getting her there, I'll just say, was, was, was no cakewalk. Um, because though Holland is celebrated by Biden and the White House now, the truth is that um, Madam Secretary, before she was Madam Secretary, was actually the Biden transition team's, uh, was not the Biden transition team's preferred candidate for Interior Secretary. That was actually former New Mexico Senator Tom Udall. And in fact, one could even argue that Deb wasn't even the preferred Native American candidate of uh, Democratic insiders. That was Taos Pueblo tribal member and former Deputy Interior Secretary Michael Connor. Holland, um, at the time that, that, uh, that she was being considered, was, was uh, viewed by some as, as too liberal as, as too inexperienced and as too politically risky to a point. And in November of 2020, according to the New York Times, uh, she wasn't really much of a serious candidate. So right after Biden was elected, she wasn't considered much of a serious candidate. And to get her in, we had to get people like me, had to get people like you behind her 
nomination. You might have even been one of the people who tweeted or voiced your support for her nomination. Um, and to do that, we we first had to get her name out there. And uh, I actually um, hold the distinction of being, I think, the person who originated the idea uh, to make Deb Hall and the Interior Secretary. I put her name on this sort of fantasy football style list of potential progressive cabinet appointments in July of 2020, so long before Biden actually um, even won the presidency. So in the months after publishing that, that uh, list, I created a buzz on my Twitter account. I gave quotes to reporters. Um, I generated a few memes and generally sort of beat the drum for, for Auntie Deb. And after Biden won in November, um, part of my career, as, as you might know, is as a, as a journalist. And so I wrote a profile. I was asked to write a profile of, of Holland uh, for Politico magazine. Um, and in my public writing and, and my media appearances and other conversations with political insiders and others, I, I built a case for Holland that not only uh, that I not only believed in, but that, that I also uh, was sort of designed to refute some of the arguments uh, against her nomination. So, for example, to show that Holland was a progressive but was also a unifier, I got Republicans uh, like the late Congressman Don Young of Alaska, as well as Congressman Tom Cole of Oklahoma, to give on-the-record comments in favor of Holland's appointment. And Holland, um, as I pointed out in my profile, was probably the only politician in America at the time and, and still now who had the support of both congressional Republicans on the one hand and the Sunrise Movement on the other. Those Venn diagrams, as I'm sure you know, don't often overlap. Um, and she had their support, both of those parties' support, because she was, in fact, uh, despite critics' uh, comments to the contrary, she was a very experienced policymaker. Her legislation had more Senate companions than any other representatives in that Congress. And as a member of that Congress, she had led, co-sponsored, and whipped influential and bipartisan votes for more bills than any other House freshman. And in an era of partisan gridlock, Holland actually saw three of her acts signed into law in just two years, which is a pretty remarkable record for a House of Representatives freshman. And when critics said Democrats couldn't risk losing her seat in a special election because the party at the time uh, and still only possessed a, a very slim majority at the time, it was a seven vote majority. Um, I actually looked at past congressional results. I checked the record. And as it turned out, over the past five election cycles, Democrats had won Holland's seat by an average of 21 points. So privately, uh, after sort of building this case, helping build this case in public, I told Speaker Pelosi's staff um, that standing in the way of, of Holland's appointment would discourage rising stars like her in the Democratic caucus and would actually signal weakness. It wouldn't strengthen the Democratic majority. It would point out how... Um, how weak it was in the House of Representatives if she stood in the way of her appointment. Uh, and despite the fact that almost all congressional Republicans and Big Oil opposed Holland's nomination, um, you got to remember this is the politician who went and cooked green chili stew and tortillas for the water protectors at Standing Rock. Um, despite that fact, despite their opposition, Holland actually prevailed. And as now the Interior Secretary, uh, she leads a bureau that's responsible for managing about one fifth of the United States landmass, vast swaths of natural resources, as well as the federal government's nation to nation relationship with the more than 570 Alaska Native and American Indian uh, tribes across the country. And in the last two years, she's, I think, made, um, made a real difference with her leadership. She's overseen the creation of a new unit within the Bureau of Indian Affairs to tackle the decades long, maybe even centuries long crisis of, of Native people going missing and murdered. She uh, formed a task force to change the names of 650 places across the United States that use the derogatory word squaw in uh, their official name. And she also launched an inquiry. And this one is, I think, very important to me. 
uh, into federal Indian boarding schools. Uh, and that inquiry has already identified over 500 deaths of children uh, at those schools. And in a country, um, I think it should be said, in a country found on, founded on the brutalization of Native women, of Native people, of Native nations, of Native land, Holland is um, really a pathbreaker for future generations of Indigenous leadership. And I am so incredibly grateful that we have her. I'm so incredibly grateful I had the opportunity to advocate for her. Uh, and I believe that we need many more like her. Um, and you know, we don't all obviously get to be Deb Holland, but I think that that story, um, you know, the work that I got to do on behalf of something that I believed in shows that we all have opportunities and, and responsibilities, big and small, to do something about climate, climate change. Now, that might be on the front lines, that might be in a leadership a position, uh, or in my case, it might be you know, something more behind the scenes. And um, you know, I decided to speak today uh, at this fundraiser for Fresh Energy because I believe that this is an organization that's doing something significant, that is taking that responsibility very seriously uh, in the state of Minnesota, that it's really leading the fight against climate change in, this, in a state that, that means a lot to me. And so what you are doing right now, um, I know and I believe uh, it can make a difference. I think that it can reach all the way from St. Paul to the White House, and to the rocky banks of the Fraser River where, um, and many other places around the world where people are, are living at the edge of uh, where the climate is making it, it, it a habitable planet anymore. So I just wanna thank you. I wanna say Kooks Jetsham for, for being here today um, and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Julian Brave Noise Cat, it has been an honor to hear from you today at our benefit breakfast. I am personally wowed by your story and the impact that you've made through your words, your actions, your leadership. Let's go right to first things first. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, recent action by the Congress on climate change with the Inflation Reduction Act. It's a pretty surprising new law and it cuts carbon pollution 10 times more than any previous law that's ever been passed. How do you think we got to this point in history? From your point of view, how did we get here? You know, I remember in 2018, uh, I was at Glenn's Beer Garden. This was back when I lived in Washington, D.C., with a bunch of young climate activists. And they were telling me about this crazy idea they had to um, do a sit in in the House of Representatives. Actually, they were going to do it in the incoming speaker's office. Uh, and the group was called the Sunrise Movement. And at that time, nobody except for like people who lived and breathed climate change activism specifically knew who the Sunrise Movement was. And, you know, I, there's obviously a lot that happened from uh, the fall of 2018 to now that, that got us to the Inflation Reduction Act. But I sincerely believe that that energy that the Sunrise Movement and the Green New Deal and this new generation of climate activists um, injected into the cause of climate change really put the wind in the sails of the movement that that needed to happen to get past the finish line. You know, there's a whole bunch of steps between then and here, um, but to me, that's sort of where uh, this sort of hopeful uh, chapter of of uh, climate politics and policy began. So just so you know, I always uh, credit the uh, youth climate movement all around the world. Uh, in my, my first line of thank you is to little girls sitting in front of a school in Sweden and thousands and thousands and thousands of young people, including yourself, who led this movement over the last three years. So let's uh, change the subject and talk a little bit about the communities at the front line of the conflict with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, just this year, we uh, at Fresh Energy documented the pollution from power plants in northern Minnesota and how that affects public health, a burden that falls heavily on under-resourced communities and 
communities of color and particularly native populations. Let's talk a little bit, how can the energy transition reduce the harm to these communities, these communities who bear the greatest burden of our reliance on fossil fuels? The burden of, of poverty and pollution has disproportionately fallen on um, poor people, working class communities, and in particular, I would say indigenous communities and, and people of color over uh, not just the last 50 years, but you know, 100, 200 years. That has been always been been the reality in the United States. And you know, the the truth of the matter is that one of the best ways that we can address that disproportionate burden of pollution is simply to transition away from those forms of dirty energy. Um, you know, every time a coal plant uh, closes, you know, the neighboring community is not going to have to live with uh, dirty air any longer. You know, there might be lingering effects, of course, of some of these industries having been there. Um, but, you know, we are taking those pollutants out of out of their neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, the same is true for uh, closing fossil fuel uh, production and, and pipelines and things of that nature and transitioning away from that. So, um, you know, I don't want to say that that is the ultimate solution to all the problems. Obviously, there's legacies of, of these industries and uh, clean energy itself, you know, is not without its environmental impacts. Uh, but that is clearly one of the, the best ways that we can address uh, the racial injustices of the fossil fuel economy. You know, Jillian, I, I know right now that uh, in your life, you're moving from a really intense focus on climate, energy, social justice, and now you are really deeply immersing yourself in your own cultural traditions and your indigenous history, and you're working on a book, and you're working on a documentary. So. Are there insights in what you're learning now that could inform the work of the climate movement? You know, I think that one of the most amazing things that I see in, in Native communities is, on the one hand, um, there is this very present and deep pain uh, that stems from the near annihilation of our people, of our way of life, uh, the nearly complete theft of our lands, um, in many instances, the loss of our culture, of our languages, you know, this truly apocalyptic break uh, from a world that not too long ago, you know, not that many generations ago was, was ours. Um, and in that sort of post-apocalyptic, um, state of being, you know, I, I think that we have still found ways to love each other, to to be community together in a way that that is, um, I would say, much deeper than most people living today. You know, we still very much being related means a lot. We spend a lot of time with each other um, and we've retained and, and made great efforts to protect uh, the land that we that we still have and the language and culture that we still remember and to bring it back to, to, to regenerate it. And I think that that story, that parable of um, beauty and resilience in the face of apocalypse, you know, I think could say a lot, says a lot to um, the better side of our humanity when we face uh, truly, um, you know, world shattering challenges. And I would say climate change is, is one of those potentially world shattering um, challenges. And, you know, I, in that, I believe that there are uh, things that can be gleaned and learned from the indigenous experience. Julian Brave Noise Cat, you inspire all of us at Fresh Energy, not to mention people across the country and around the world. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it was such a, such a pleasure. So Julian, would uh, you be willing to talk just a little while longer uh, so we can send some bonus content out to all those folks who make a donation here today? Yeah, absolutely. That would, that would be a lot of fun. Great. Thanks so much. Now let's turn this back to Mari. Thank you, Michael and Julian. Julian's story is truly powerful and the climate movement has gained so much with his voice and contributions. I loved how Julian put it when he said that fresh energy 
is an org organization that's doing something significant. By taking seriously the responsibility to do something about climate change in Minnesota, and he's absolutely right. At Fresh Energy, we take that responsibility to heart, and we know that you do too. That's why you support Fresh Energy. And speaking of supporting Fresh Energy, we have one more short video to share with you featuring three friends who are big Fresh Energy fans. We're calling this video Out and About with Michael Noble. Let's join them on this all-electric, multimodal road trip. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Noble, the executive director of Fresh Energy. You often hear from me about the mission and work of our organization, but today I'm hitting the road, and we're gonna hear from three different folks who know Fresh Energy pretty well. For 30 years, Fresh Energy, a Minnesota-based nonprofit, has been changing the world through bold clean energy and climate policy solutions that move us to a just, carbon-free future. Which brings me to my first stop, with Shantara Hardy, a force in her own right for advancing equitable policy. She co-founded Fearless Commerce, helping black women grow businesses. And Civic Eagle, providing legislative tools for groups like Fresh Energy. Shantara helped plant the seeds for what our equity-focused work is today, a team that helps set our policy goals. Hi, Shantara. Hi, Mike. How, How are you? How are you? It's been way too long. I know, so How good to see you. Oh, it's been a while. I thought we should meet at the Green Line because I, I can't think of equitable transportation without thinking about you. Why is equity and access so important to this energy transition? If we are not thinking about those that are the most impacted, we are going to transition in a way that we build in those inequities into the new system. We have been working on these issues for forever. And being able to have an organization that has stood the test of time, that is willing to be courageous, to have the hard conversations, but to reach across the aisle and also to reach across neighborhoods and communities, to be willing to learn about other communities, to make sure that their stories are, are authentically heard. I believe that's where Fresh Energy stands um, apart. Many more voices will be at the table to make it a much more equitable and comprehensive future. And so here's the 30 years. Cheers to Fresh Energy. We are striving to ensure clean power from sources like wind and solar is the foundation of our carbon-free electricity supply. And simultaneously, we're working to electrify everything we can. Our efforts have been amped up by recent federal action too. Speaking of amped up, my next stop is with Laura Bishop at a solar array. At Best Buy, Laura showed us how a Fortune 100 company can lead on sustainability and then carried that expertise to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency where, in her time as commissioner, she made policy changes to help our state meet its climate goals. Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you? Great. Nice to Thank see you. you. Nice to see you. I wanted to bring you out here today just to show you what big change looks like, a Minnesota solar farm. <laughs> it's pretty huge. Yeah. yeah. So, Laura, how important is the public policy itself to driving change like this? Well, policy is very important, and we see it both, you know, with our legislatures, but we see it with businesses asking for change and wanting to make change. And we know that it's not a one size fits all. So people have to come together and work together to find a solution that works for everybody. And with that, you get outcomes like this. I mean, it's really amazing to see what good policy and partnerships, like what you work on at Fresh Energy, bring together to find a solution. You are now bringing more and more people to the table. And that's an important part of looking at and looking forward to good policy. Renewable energy is here to stay and it is getting less expensive over time. And that's what you've driven. Laura, thanks so much for uh, taking time to meet with me today. I guess I see my ride is here, so I'm gonna run, okay? Okay, thank <laughs> you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Kristen, how hey, are you? Hey, Michael, what's going on? Can I put the bike in the back? Sure. To avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to transition our economy to be carbon neutral before 2050. Fresh energy is rising to the challenge with policy change that benefits people in all corners of the state, including the North, which brings me to my next guest. 
Kristen Eggerling goes way back with Fresh Energy, first getting to know us at the Minnesota Legislature. From there, she and her husband opened Ford and Chrysler dealerships in Halleck and Roseau. Both in her business and personal life, Kristen is dedicated to making sure energy and climate policies don't leave rural Minnesota behind. So Kristen, here we are at uh, one of uh, Minnesota's thousands of EV stations, really all over the state. Uh, is, how important is this to you and your customers that uh, EV charging access be available everywhere in Minnesota? Rural Minnesotans don't want to be left behind, and this is one way um, to ensure that, that we all have access. We all know that government needs a push. Fresh energy can help educate legislators and hold government officials accountable, as well as educate the public on climate change action. I appreciate Fresh Energy's focus on science, education, policy, the economy. It all adds up. I also appreciate that Fresh Energy is bold, but in addition, you're reasonable and uh, willing to be flexible and work with rural um, initiatives and the rural lifestyle in addition to urban. Kristen, that was great. Uh, thanks for meeting me here today. Uh, I, th I think we have a full charge. Uh, do you mind uh, giving me a lift? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I consider the folks I caught up with today to be people who make things happen, just like Fresh Energy. I keep saying, Fresh Energy is celebrating our 30 years of history by continuing to make history for clean energy and climate here in Minnesota and the Midwest. And that's thanks in large part to our supporters. Thanks, everybody. What a day we had. You know, as I look forward to the clean energy future that we're building together. I'm filled with hope and confidence. I'm so proud of the work that Fresh Energy's done to build this clean energy economy. You know, and it's with that hope and that confidence that I'm thinking about what's next for me personally. Some people might call it retiring, but I'm calling it rewiring. And it's not now, it's over the next year. And we'll keep everybody who loves Fresh Energy in the loop along the way. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on our benefit breakfast today. Huge thank you to Shantara, Laura, and Kristen for meeting up with Michael to talk about Fresh Energy's past and future. And Michael, thanks for sharing your news with our guests this morning. As we wrap up, I am so moved and inspired by all the folks who joined us today and their generous gifts to support Fresh Energy. We know you're making a lot of effort in your lives to take meaningful action for climate change, and we're honored that you trust Fresh Energy with your support to build our clean energy future together. We did it. I had fun doing this with you, Joe. I did too. On behalf of Fresh Energy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. See you next year. Bye. <laughs>